Uh, and now we have a presentation uh, from Dr. Kultip Dave, the ALS Association strategy to increase the number of clinical trials in ALS. Kultip. Um, you can hear me okay? All right. Uh, thanks, Alliance, uh, for um, allowing us to uh, present on our strategies and initiatives that the ALS Association have undertaken to increase number of clinical trials. And a, a, a really important thing, it's not just more clinical trials. It's more, better, faster clinical trials. And so you'll hear me say that over and over. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Larkin and Dr. Gary and Dr. Thacker. Um, I'm giving the talk today, Kuldeep Dave, head of research, uh, but they uh, have been instrumental in contributing to the strategies and initiatives that we have launched. All right, so before we do that, um, very quick, um, just want to bring your attention to our mission of the ALS Association to make ALS a livable disease while we work to cure it. And there are three pillars, as you can see. Um, one, finding new treatments and cures, um, optimizing current treatments and care, and preventing or delaying harms associated with the ALS. And we could probably spend another 20 minutes on just this slide, but um, I can't. And so there is a, a little link that will allow you to uh, read into details uh, what our, our pillars are, what do they mean, how do we get there. And so this is really important. I think you heard earlier from uh, one of my colleagues uh, in care services, but while today I'm going to talk about research and what research and advocacy has done to increase number of clinical trials, um, it's not happening in vacuum. We have uh, care services and advocacy that are informing research and our strategy. And so that's really important to keep in mind. Um, just very quick things about us and our research program. Uh, we have committed over $200 million to ALS research since the inception of our organization. And 120 million of that has come since the Ice Bucket Challenge in, um, in 2014, 2015. We fund across the uh, world. Uh, the good science doesn't stop at any border. Um, and the world is our lab. And, and so we fund all over the world. Um, any of our RFAs that I'll talk about, uh, they are open to uh, uh, people outside of the United States. So when you go back to your territories and regions and countries, uh, please uh, ask your, encourage your investigators to apply. And we fund academic labs, pharma uh, industry, government labs. We even fund other nonprofit organizations. All right, so if there's one thing you take away from my talk today, it should be this uh, figure. Um, and uh, people at the association are tired of this but <laughs> because they've seen this uh, come up every time I give a talk. Um, but this is our research ecosystem. And so on the left, or my left, is uh, the drug development pipeline. And then on the right is the managing ALS pipeline. And what you see if you start all the way to your left is um, the biology and genetics of ALS. Sort of, this is the basic understanding of what, how is ALS different um, from uh, everything else? What happens? What's the physiological? What are the changes that happen uh, that I, that is driving the pathology of the disease? That mostly happens in the academic labs. Once you have a target, uh, a protein that changes then you start leveraging that to develop drugs against it. And that's the preclinical drug development. That's the next stage. Uh, again, that's happening in academia, but now the industry is, um, uh, it, it, there's more and more biotech and pharma that are driving that preclinical drug development space and biomarker development space. And then, of course, you run into the three phases of trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, clinical trials. And if your drug is lucky enough to get through all of that pipeline, you get to a drug approval. But there's also research on the other side. Uh, you just heard from Dr. Kavanaugh, uh, and we funded that work um, on the managing ALS side, on 
uh, whether it's research into assistive technology or telehealth, telemedicine research, real world data once the drug is approved, uh, access, quality of life, patient surveys uh, that Melinda talked about, uh, patient family burden, a natural history, and expanded access. And then underneath it all is the infrastructure, which is never the most sexiest piece to talk about, but uh, it's really important, and I'll, I'll point out some examples of that. Um, so we fund across this ecosystem. Doesn't mean we fund all of the every part of this, because there are other players in the ecosystem that fund it. For example, we don't fund expanded access research because we advocated for the NIH to have funding for expanded access research. And now you know that through Act for ALS, they are doing that. We don't fund phase three studies because they're huge and large, and uh, we couldn't even put our entire research dollars into one single trial. But we know industry and biotech and venture uh, space is picking that up. And, and just as a snapshot, as of today, we have 122 active projects across the world, 13 countries, and if you count up uh, the number of dollars committed, that's 42 million. This changes all the time because projects open and close are active. Uh, we are currently contracting about 30 different projects, and so we expect that number to be around 150 active projects by January, and probably around $50 million committed. So today I'm gonna to talk about increasing the number of trials, and again, more, better, faster. And so I will talk about the different ways we are going after this ecosystem and where we are pr pressing the lever or pushing the buttons to get that increase in number of ALS trials. And so one way to do, is, do it is through pushing the lever on the preclinical side, on the drug development side. And we have a program called Barnett Drug Development Awards. Um, the full name is uh, Lawrence and Isabel Barnett Program. And uh, this program bridges the gap between academic research and commercial development. And the, uh, this was established back in 2015. Each project gets half a million dollars uh, for two years. And we generally fund about six projects a year. And um, what the, the, the type of preclinical drug development that it funds is late stage uh, safety testing, dose finding, uh, uh, manufacturing scale-up, um, uh, target engagement, safety and tox, things that are needed for IND filing. So the idea with the Barnett program is that in less than three years after we fund it, that it gets into the clinic, and so we have more clinical trials. Uh, as of today, uh, since 2015, we have funded about 38 programs. Uh, $13 million in commitment. Uh, 23 of them have gone to academia and 15 to industry. And this program has, has been tremendously successful. Um, I think probably beyond our expectation when we launched it. So just to give you some numbers on this, 12 projects have completed out of the 38 that I just mentioned. Four of those uh, from the 12 projects are currently in clinical trials. Uh, for example, prodopidine, as you know, is one of the, um, one of the drugs that is in the Healy platform trial. Uh, this one number was very surprising, 65% uh, of projects. So we actually track which of these 38 projects went on to get follow-on funding or partnership. And this partnership could be partnership with biotech or pharma, venture capital investment, grant funding from NIH or Department of Defense. Um, and I've given you some examples here, Curalis, for example, securing a Series A funding, or Cario Farm that uh, 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 partnered up with Biogen, uh, or Izumi Biosciences that was able to get a follow-on Department of Defense uh, grant. 65% of our projects go on to get uh, secure partnership or follow-on funding. And the other part that was really surprising is the six-fold return on investment. Um, so we, again, calculate that we, we put in X dollars. How, how many dollars are then put in on that project to take it forward by either the DOD or the NIH or VC or uh, large pharma? And what we have seen that every dollar that we invested, there are six additional dollars that were, invest, were invested 
to take that program forward, either by the government or venture capital or pharma. Six-fold return on investment. So again, this is a, a really successful uh, program for us, and we continue to do it. We do fund this program internationally, um, if you're interested. And just as a, by the way, this is not, it's not like we were not funding preclinical work before 2015. That's the last bullet here. Prior to the Barnett program, we had been funding preclinical research. Uh, for example, we, f we were the first ones to fund the ASO work, the NSNS nucleotide work uh, back in 2004 and 2006. And we know today that uh, if you track the development of the ASO technology all the way to Tofersen, uh, which is now um, standing at the cusp of uh, you know, getting um, an FDA ad com and hopefully an approval for people with SOD1 ASO, uh, SOD1 uh, ALS. Um, so moving to another way we can push the lever is through at funding clinical trial awards themselves. And so we do have an early, uh, clinical trial awards program. Again, this is open internationally. Um, and here the idea is to generate more shots on goal because we know that 95% of drugs that go through that pipeline fail either in phase one or phase two or phase three. And so the more, sh more therapeutics we have funded, more early stage clinical trials we have, the more chances that one of them will be successful. And here, each project can receive up to a million dollars for three years. We fund generally early stage phase one, phase two trials, exploring safety, dosing, biomarker development. Um, and you can see some of the examples here, uh, RAPA 501, um, enoxacine, some of the uh, uh, trials that we have funded. Again, it's important to know, even though this was started in 2021, we have been funding clinical trials for a long time through our different programs. In fact, you can see last two decades of uh, clinical trials, whether it was TREG, RNS60, uh, HRFK um, uh, viral um, uh, approaches, neuron. Uh, FAS ASO is a really interesting one because we were able to de-risk that early work with Dr. Neil Schneider uh, and now Ionis uh, Pharmaceuticals is doing a, a full um, phase three study uh, using that same FUS ASO. And of course, um, we would be remiss not talking about what just happened a few months ago, uh, approval uh, by the FDA of AMX0035 or Relivrio, and we were the first ones, uh, or one of the first ones to provide greater than $2 million investment funding uh, in early research and, and, and that was done through uh, Ice Bucket Fund Challenge uh, funding, and uh, we're just happy that um, that is available now as a treatment for uh, ALS. This is really interesting because I just showed you two levers to press. This is a lever where we wanted to press on the capacity piece. Remember, more, better, faster trials. And so the idea was, and we would hear this from clinical trial sites all the time, I wish I had more clinical trial coordinators. I could run more trials. I wish we had more uh, nursing assistants so that someone can do navigation with patients while someone can actually be doing, uh, conducting the trial so that the startup uh, and the initiation is faster. And this was a brand new RFA that we just launched uh, this year. Um, and uh, each project would re would receive up to $400,000. Now this is only US on, this is a US only RFA. So this is the one that is a little different. Uh, we are going to think about how to pilot this for sites outside of United States. But the idea was to give them funding for four years and it would support establishment of both new trial sites, but also improvement of existing ones. And so p funding can be used not for science you know, that you'd normally think of, but for infrastructure, things like personnel, trial coordinators, equipment, you can get a minus 80 freezer, uh, training if you wanna send your coordinators to NEALS to get trained, whatever is needed to increase trial capacity. And, um, and just I'm happy to report to you that 13 clinical sites were selected. Uh, in fact, if it's okay, I would like to mention uh, Dr. Terry Hyman Patterson is sitting in the audience and she, uh, hers is one of the sites that is being uh, funded. Uh, it's an established site, uh, but Dr. H um, Patterson is trying to increase uh, minority enrollment uh, for blacks and Latinos in Philadelphia area. And uh, again, that's something 
uh, those are the types of things that are um, uh, being funded through this trial capacity. Another site is, uh, is uh, on an island off in the south. I can't name it yet because it's not contracted, but there's about 130 people with ALS there who had to fly to either Houston or Miami to be in trials. And now there's going to be a site there. Um, so again, uh, you know, it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, just a couple of more slides here. Um, Dr. Gary, who is in the audience, um, is leading another program here called the Mission Acceleration Program. And this is really interesting. We talked about technologies before. And the idea here is that there are a broad range of technologies. We talked about BCI, but there's assistive technologies, diagnostics, medical devices even technologies for drug delivery. Uh, and these could come from anywhere. These could come from one of our RFAs, but they could be private sector, they could be academia. And the idea would be to identify these candidate technologies, evaluate them through an um, advisory group. And this advisory group would look at readiness of the technology, commercial, commercialization, viability, market potential, and come up with two or three key questions for that technology. What's gonna take for that technology to be de-risked? What is it gonna take to get it to the next stage? And the association is going to invest $250,000 in those two or three experiments that need to be done for that technology. And once those experiments are done, those de-risked technologies will be shopped uh, to venture investors via established networks. And there could be co-investment opportunities, licensing, uh, new startups, technologies. Again, the idea here is to, to accelerate those uh, device or drug technologies forward. So finally, I think my last slide, as I see um, Andrea get up, is on the infrastructure. And this is really important. Again, nobody speaks about infrastructure, but it's, it's really in, important because it enables and enhances clinical trial capacity. And I want to bring some quick examples on this. We have been funding NEALS, which is the largest clinical trial consortium now in the world, um, for many years. Uh, and, um, but it's not just the NEALS uh, operational uh, readiness that we fund, but we also fund biosample collection with Neurobank, for example, or Target ALS repository. We are funding um, data collection. Um, uh, you, may, you all may know that clinical trial data, all and at least most of it, we hope, ends up in PROACT database, which was started by a person living with ALS, Avi Kramer. We now own that database and is run out of MGH, uh, and we encourage invest, uh, investigators in this room to uh, put their data into PROACT. Um, we also, we talked about all this. We didn't talk about training of people. And so the, you know, we need the, the new blood, the new personnel to, be, to, to keep coming into our space. And so we have partnered with American Brain Foundation to fund clinical fellowships. These are really important. And in fact, one of the first person that was funded through this training was Dr. Michael Benatar, who now we all know and is actually the, the chair of the research committee at the, the ALS Association. And finally, I think, um, I think Colin Eats spoke about this on recruitment and retention piece, we were working on clinical trial matchmaker tool. You know, you saw Maury this morning talk about amazing technology on hand. How do we use that technology to connect those clinical trial sites with people who want to be in trials? And so we are piloting, working with um, Cytokinetics uh, on their trial to see if uh, that tool works, and then we could uh, socialize it for all. Um, for all. And, um, and maybe I'll skip that, <laughs> sorry. Uh, just very quick points here. We can't do it all. And so even though we are doing quite a bit, but there are parts of this ecosystem that are so complex that we can leverage government dollars. And so you could see that we have advocated for dollars for CDC that's working on risk and causes or for the Department of Defense that f works in their late early stage um, uh, clinical trials, or uh, us uh, having to push uh, or advocating for more dollars for NIH. By the way, the NIH has increased their investment from $60 million in 2016 to $120 million. 
in uh, this year. And so again, you know, and because they are able to focus on the biology and genetics, that means we can, we don't have to have an RFA on that because the NIH is doing that. So again, all of us don't have to fund the same thing. We just have to coordinate uh, better. And so I'll just stop here. Um, there are all these uh, sites that are down here um, uh, that might be uh, interesting for you to look at. Uh, I think what I want you to take back is that we have a holistic strategy to increase trials more, better, and faster. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I went over. <laughs> That's okay. Um, fascinating to hear of what's happening uh, to move forward with the funding to increase clinical trials. Um, can I open it up for questions? David. Hey, Caldeb, that's awesome. You know I'm a big fan of all of this. I had a quite, <laughs> I damn. Uh, I have a question regarding when we do more shots on goal, and just recently at Niels it was mentioned, for example, the Ataxin 2 trial was something that wasn't recruiting very fast, and it's an invasive one, it's an ASO, it's intra intrathecal. Um, but in terms of biological plausibility and ALS preclinical evidence, it's an interesting one that could probably help us understand the disease better. Yeah. But in favor of putting you know, if, the, if we get to a point where we have a lot of things that are maybe more generic and some things that are more specific, do you have any thoughts on how we might be able to parse those out to prioritize those that can help us understand the disease better through clinical trials and also make sure that those ones are also prioritized? Yeah, I mean, in, in an ideal world, David, we would love to push as many shots on goal forward and make sure that they're all recruited the same way that you're right. What you're so what David is talking about is there's an ATAX in ASO trial which is not recruiting uh, that well, and perhaps the biology is not understood that well, and in fact the validation of that target is probably much stronger than some of the other therapies that are um, being tested, and so um, you know. The, it's, it's a tough question. I, th I, think, uh, I, th I think we have to educate uh, and inform better. I think this is what came up at Niels. Um, you know, people with ALS, they, they don't know what is, you know, biologically or target validation standpoint stronger than something else. And, um, you know, they shouldn't have to pick. Uh, and hopefully their doctors shouldn't have to pick which trial they go into. If, if, if we do all the things that I just talked about and we create enough of an opportunity, hopefully more and more people can be in the, in the trials and then we don't have to pick and choose and say, actually, Ataxin is better than drug X uh, or drug Y. So um, it's, it's, it's hard to answer that. Thanks. I know it's a cop-out, but. I see, uh, thank you. I see uh, Gethin, I think, has a question, yes? Uh, yes. Oh, hopefully this is a bit quicker. Um, so with your mission acceleration program, um, you said you provide the uh, 250K for answering the questions. And do you also provide the resources to actually develop those questions? How do you actually get to that stage? I, I kind of missed that. You know, you said there was three key questions. Is yeah. that a back and forth? Or? Yeah, I was going to ask Dr. Gary to answer that, but I actually don't see him in the room. I think he may have... Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> there, there you go. So uh, this approach of uh, the number of 250K is sort of a target number. Um, you may be below that. You may be above it. You notice all the technologies that um, Coldup mentioned are amenable to investments, answering questions um, to get it uh, de-risked within that, that cost range. But there certainly may be some of these technologies that go through the de-risking program we're excited about, and we want to uh, put it on a, a, a good trajectory towards commercialization, so we may reinvest, um, bring in other partners, co-invest. Um, there'll be a variety of strategies um, to look at these. But uh, again, this level of investment, 250K, is sort of ballpark. So I did this before in my previous life, um, mainly in the animal health space. Um, Companies in the Midwest, there's the largest number of animal health companies in the world. 
they were really interested in new technologies and we used a process like this to move technologies faster, faster, get those companies interested in investing and in getting in the market. So the model works. Um, this is new for the association, um, but we're not necessarily blazing any new trails here. Uh, you look at venture philanthropy by several other disease-focused um, organizations, and they've taken similar approaches. They've spent um, a lot more money than we're talking about spending, uh, cystic fibrosis specifically. Uh, they, they dumped um, hundreds of millions of dollars on the early side of things. We're focused on the other end of the, the funnel, things closer to commercialization, a couple of key experiments, and they're on their way. Hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. I want to make sure that we're cognizant of time as well. I think we have one online question, and I think one in the room, and that'll, that'll have to be it for this session. I, uh, I do have a mechanism uh, to open international operation for the clinical trial, because a lot of patients uh, call me that we want to uh, get into a trial that's been uh, happening in the uh, US. So do you have any mechanism? For people, like on the more we get patients uh, trying, or many, we will find out uh, sooner. Yeah, so the question was, how do we get people outside of the United States uh, that are inquiring how they want to be in trials? Um, that, that's, I think, one of the things we have been thinking about through this clinical trial capacity program, which is how do we this is in the United States right now. It's focused on getting capacity up. How do we expand that outside of the uh, United States? I know Ka uh, Kathy Cummings um, and you know, we have discussed how do we incentivize um, trial sites, uh, trial centers to be trial sites outside of the uh, United States, especially in you know, uh, countries where there may not be a lot of trial opportunities. Um, uh, you know, um, Neil, Neil Tacker and myself have had a co early conversations again with Kathy on, you know, how to leverage existing infrastructure. So, for example, South America may already have some sites that are kind of loosely working together, uh, and how do we uh, use that um, to, and, and leverage that to actually to to drive. Uh, trial infrastructure. So it's going to take it's going to take some some work. Uh, I don't think I have an easy answer right now. <laughs> okay, we're going to take one last quick question and move on. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you. It's really interesting to see the the comprehensive approach that you guys are taking. Um, my question really revolves around caregivers. Caregivers are you know essential in the clinical trial uh, pipeline and really supporting them. Um, we know from your work from ALS Focus and the high costs mm -hmm. and the burden. Um, is that something that uh, you have given any consideration? I know there's IRB things with inducement, but I, I do think there is room uh, to compensate the caregivers for their time. Yeah. Um, and I think having those conversations with industry as well as, you know, the funds from, from the ALS Association. Yeah, Lauren, we just, we had a roundtable about a month and a half ago uh, on uh, increasing trial capacity. And one of the sessions was exactly that, which is talking about um, the burden it, it takes on both person living with ALS and their family member. So we had an example, sorry, uh, quick, a quick example on this. Um, we had a, a person living with ALS who was driving six hours to get to a trial site and staying there for three nights and then coming back. And that happened for the whole year and a half that they were in that trial. And that meant that their family member, someone had to go with them, either the wife or someone else had to then take a day off or take days off, be there uh, with, the per with their you know, family member, person living with ALS, and, and then come back. So there, we did talk in this round table with, uh, we had you know, representatives from Biogen and Amelix on the, on the round table and talked about how industry and uh, sort of this general ecosystem can incentivize um, and reduce that burden, financial burden, physical burden, 
on uh, not just people living with ALS who are in trials, but uh, their, their caregivers and family members as well. Excellent topic. Thank you very much, Colt Thanks. Thanks.